Well, hello and welcome back to another episode. It's great to see you all. I hope you're doing well. So today I want to continue with our series on writing a ray tracer in C++ using as far as possible only the standard libraries and the SDL2 library so that we can display the results in a window. In the previous episode, which was now admittedly a couple of weeks ago, um, we looked at how we could implement basic materials, including Fong shading for specular highlights and reflections and things like that. What I want to look at this week is how we can implement some different shapes and I'm going to focus on cones and cylinders and it's relatively easy to do those because of the work that we've done already on the geometric transform stuff a couple of episodes ago I'll put a link in the description below as usual and that as you'll see makes it relatively easy to do different shapes such as cones and cylinders um, it, without that they're really much more difficult to do which is why um, in my opinion, most ray tracing tutorials really only focus on planes and spheres because they can be defined relatively easily in different locations and different sizes and so on. A cylinder is much more difficult to define if you want to consider anything other than an infinitely long cylinder that lies along one of the principal axes. Anyway, that's what we're going to talk about today, so hopefully that will be of interest. I don't want to do a long introduction, but just before we jump into that, I want to say, as I always do, that if you like this video, please do remember to hit that like button. It really does help with the YouTube algorithm. And if you haven't done so already, please consider subscribing to my channel so you don't have to miss any future videos. Thank you very much. Anyway, right, without much further ado, let's jump to it and let's look at how we can implement cones and cylinders in our ray tracer. Okay, let's go. Okay, so here we are. I just want to, as I always do, go over a little bit of the theory first, some of the mathematics behind how we can implement cones and cylinders uh, in our ray tracer. And we're going to look at cylinders first, but um, first of all, I wanted to consider the general problem. So we can actually implement any shape that we like in our ray tracer if we can form a suitable mathematical expression for its surface. Now, this will be in terms of x, y, and z, representing all of the points on the surface, otherwise known as the implicit representation of that surface. And then we can then use the equation for a line, which is, after all, our ray that we've cast into the scene, given in the form that you can see here where some vector consisting of x, y, and z is equal to a point that I've noted here as px, py, pz, plus some scalar quantity t multiplied by a vector v with vx, vy, and vz. So this is the standard equation for a line um, expressed in vector form, and this will give values for x, y, and z in terms of t, as you can see here. So we end up with x is equal to px plus t v x y p y plus t v y and z equals p z plus t v z. Okay, fairly straightforward. So all we then have to do is then substitute those values for x, y, and z back into the equation for the surface, and we solve for t. And then we can use the value of t with the original line equation to determine the location of the point of intersection. And that is the basic theory. That is really how we go about implementing any shape or any surface that we want within our ray tracer. So let's look at this for the specific case of a cylinder. Now, for reasons that I think will become obvious later, we're going to consider an infinitely long cylinder orientated along the z-axis. So, if we look at that end-on, we'll get something that looks like this. So, we're looking at it end-on, so we're looking down the z-axis, if you like. So, we see our x and y-axis, as we see here in blue, and then this is our, our cylinder here, represented by this dashed uh, circle of radius r. Okay? Now, it's just a circle of radius r, which of course we can express as x squared plus y squared equals z squared. And as the cylinder is infinite along the z-axis, the value of z really doesn't matter. Okay, So remember, this circle here is the cross-section of our cylinder, orientated in the z-axis. Okay, right. So what about how do we actually test for intersection? So let's consider the case where we have a line, shown here in orange, that runs from a point p, and has a direction given by the vector v. Okay, now this line I've called L, it's represented by the vector L, is then given by the point P plus the scalar quantity t multiplied by v. Now that is the equation for the line that we just saw. Now in this particular case, we only need to consider x and y because, as we've said, z is, you know, the cylinder is infinitely long in the z-axis, so z doesn't matter. So we have that L of x, Lx is equal to px plus tvx, and Ly is equal to py plus tvy. Now, this is our equation for the line here, 
vector L equals vector P plus the scalar T multiplied by the vector V. And the equation for our circle, which of course is our cross section of our cylinder, is x squared plus y squared equals r squared. So we know that intersection, represented by the two yellow circles here, occurs when Px plus Tvx, which was the expression we had for x, if you remember if I go back, so the expression we have for x here, Lx, is Px plus Tvx. So we put that into x here, so we get Px plus Tvx squared plus Py plus Tvy squared equals r squared. And if we solve this equation for t, then that will give us the values of t when intersection occurs between this line and this circle. This is very similar to what we did for a sphere, except of course really we're just ignoring the z-coordinate. Alright, so we can actually go about rearranging that equation, which will make it much easier to see what's going on. So we have this, we have px plus tvx all squared plus py plus tvy all squared is equal to r squared. Now what we're going to do is expand out these uh, um, the expressions in these brackets and then we're going to collect terms. So we, if we expand those out we get t squared vx squared plus 2px vxt plus px squared plus t squared vy squared plus 2py vyt plus py squared is equal to r squared. And if we can rearrange that by collecting terms together, so we have a t squared vx term, so we keep that there, plus t squared vy, so we brought the two t squared terms together, plus 2px vxt plus 2py vyt, so we brought these two uh, t px expressions together, you can see what I mean, <laughs> plus px squared plus py squared is equal to r squared. And then from there, we can actually rearrange it into this form. So we see here that we have t squared multiplied by vx squared plus vy squared, that's from there, plus 2t multiplied by px vx plus py vy plus px squared plus py squared is equal to r squared. Now, that's the same expression up here, and we can see that that is of the form at squared plus bt plus c equals 0, which we know is a standard quadratic equation, Okay, where a is equal to vx squared plus vy squared, b is equal to 2px vx plus py vy, and c is equal to px squared plus, v, plus py squared minus r squared. Okay, And then we know that we can solve a quadratic equation using the standard formula that t is equal to minus b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac over 2a. Okay, so that's easy, but that's for an infinitely long cylinder lying along the z-axis. We're not interested in infinitely long cylinders. We are only ever really likely to want a finite cylinder, and we want to course it in. It. We want a course to have it in any orientation that we want. So, how can we do that? Well, recall how we're defining objects in their own local coordinate system. Okay, so because of that, we can focus on just creating a unit cylinder along the z-axis, and then we can actually can transform that however we want. So the unit cylinder will look like this shown here in, in three dimensions. So if x, y, and z in blue are axes, we have a unit radius for our cylinder in x of 1. So that's a radius, it's in x and y. And it actually is two units high because it goes to z plus 1 and to z minus 1 from the origin. So that gives a height, total height of 2. So that is what we are considering as our unit cylinder. So to actually limit the length of the cylinder, all we need to do in our local coordinate system is to compute the point of intersection and then test the value of z. If the absolute value of z is less than 1, then we know, or less than or equal to 1, then we know that we are in the cylinder, otherwise we're not. Okay, and that's what I've written here. And then once we've got our value of t, we substitute the value of t back into the equation for the line that we had by that expression, and then the point is on the cylinder if and only if the absolute value of z is less than or equal to 1. So that's really pretty straightforward. And just to recap, we use the same uh, technique with the transforms as we use for spheres and planes before. Uh, we test for intersections. We start with our cast ray, R, in the global coordinate system. And then we transform that into the local coordinate system for each object in our scene. So we get R hat is equal to T to the minus 1 times R. So R is the original ray. 
and t is the forward transform defined for our object, and t to the minus 1 is its inverse. And we can then test for intersections using the process just described to give the point of intersection, which I've called P, POI, local. And finally, we transform that back to the global coordinate system to give P, POI, global is equal to T for the forward transform multiplied by P, POI, local. And that is the whole process that we're going to implement to create cylinders. OK, now... So really, cones are pretty easy to cover because a cone is actually very similar to a cylinder, except that the radius varies along the principal axis, in this case the z-axis. Okay, So we still have a radius of 1 and a height of 2 here for our unit cone, except now we can see that the radius varies along the z-axis. So that the surface of the unit cone can therefore be expressed as x squared plus y squared equals z squared. So that's simply the equation for the circle, except we've replaced r squared for the radius with z squared. Okay, So that just means that the radius is going to be equal to the value of z between minus 1 and 1. Okay, And then we can test for intersections exactly the same way we did for the cylinder. We simply get this now, that we have px squared plus tvx squared sorry, px plus tvx all squared plus py plus tvy all squared. Now, instead of being equal to r squared, that is now equal to pz plus tvz all squared. And then we go through the same process to rearrange it. But notice now, if we skip ahead to here, we get the t squared term is now multiplied by vx squared plus vy squared minus vz squared. OK, so that's different. Also, the 2t term has this minus pz vz term. OK, and we also have a minus pz squared term here. So when we put that through the standard uh, equation for the solutions of a quadratic equation, we now get that a is equal to vx squared plus vy squared minus vz squared. b is equal to 2 into px vx plus py vy minus pz vz. And c is equal to px squared plus py squared minus pz squared. OK. That's it. And then we just go through exactly the same process that we did for before for the cylinder. And that will, of course, give us a cone. And there we go. That's really it for the theory. It's really not that complicated. And like I said in the introduction, what really makes it so simple is that we did all the work that we did on geometric transforms before. Without that, this would all be vastly more complicated than it is in this form. So what we're going to do now is jump into C++ and we're going to have a look at how we can actually implement these in code. There's a couple of minor bugs that have crept into the code in earlier episodes. We're going to look at those first, nothing serious, um, but things that became apparent to me as I, when, particularly when I implemented cylinders. So we're going to look at that and then we'll look at cylinders and then we'll look at cones. We are also going to put end caps onto our cylinders. If we implemented them simply as the way I've described here, they would be hollow. So we're defined an infinite thin mathematical surface, just the surface of the cylinder, right? So it has nothing at the end. So we will also add end caps, but that's really just implementing a plane. It, it's very easy. We'll talk about that when we come to see the code. So let's jump in and look at that now. OK, so right to start with, I'm here in the uh, GTFM uh, .hpp file or .cpp file. Sorry, this is GTFM .cpp. Uh, yeah, really should fix that. Let's fix that. <laughs> .cpp, there we go. And we need to make a minor change here, uh, which is simply to the transform order. So we, if we go down to the... where are we? Oh, where is it? Here we are. Yeah, so here we go. So we're looking at how we combine everything together. Yeah, in function set transform, and here we go. So we define the M forward transform. So originally I defined it like this, as translation matrix times scale matrix and then times each of our rotation matrices. What we're actually going to do is simply modify the order of this slightly. So we have translation matrix multiplied by, uh, let's just take that out, take out scale matrix from there, multiplied by rotation matrix X times rotation matrix Y times rotation matrix Z times um, scale matrix and save that. OK, that is the only change that we need to do. And simply we're just changing that so that the scaling is applied before the rotation. Otherwise, it makes everything very difficult when you try to define the size of things like cylinders and cones. So let's save that. And that's everything we need to do in the gtfm.cpp file. 
Okay, the next minor change is actually in pointlight.cpp. So let's look at that. Okay, so in pointlight.cpp, now this isn't actually strictly speaking a bug. Um, it is actually rather a change of um, how we're actually going to make it work. So where are we? Let's have a look. So here we go, we test for valid intersection here. So if the scene object isn't our current object, then we call the test intersection method from on the scene object that we're currently considering in order to test whether we have intersections. And this, of course, is the code that we use to implement shadows. Now, there is actually a problem with this, or a, li a limitation. If there is an object on the other side of the light, so if, suppose, the light is somewhere actually within the scene and it's possible ever to be objects on both sides of it, this will still detect an intersection. It will detect an intersection of an object that lies beyond the light and it will therefore assume that that object casts a shadow from this light to the object that we're currently considering, which is obviously not correct. So what we need to do is to insert into here some code that will test whether the intersection that has been found is between our current object and the light source or not. So we're going to do that very simply. We just put in some new code here. So if we have a valid intersection, right, just like that, we define double dist is equal to a POI for our point of intersection minus our start point that we've calculated. So start point we calculated here from the intersection point. So POI minus start point. Uh, dot norm to take the norm of that. So that gives us the distance between the point of intersection and the start point of our ray. And if that distance is greater than the light distance, okay, then we simply set valid int, valid int equals false, just like that, okay? There we go, and that's it. So that's, all, that's the only change that we need to make. It's nothing too serious. And all this is saying is if we calculate, if we detect an intersection somewhere between the, along the ray from the our current object to the light source, then we test whether the distance between the point of intersection on the current object and the uh, light point there. So what we're testing is whether the distance between the start point, which is our point on the current object, apologies, and the point of intersection with the object that we're testing, if that lies somewhere between the our current object and the light source, then we cast a shadow. Otherwise, we don't. Okay, so that means if the object that we've detected lies beyond or on the other side of the light with respect to our current object, then we don't need to cast a shadow. Anyway, that might be a little bit confusing, I'm sorry, but it it's a minor change. It doesn't make a big difference. In fact, we won't see any obvious difference with the examples that we're looking at so far. Um, but there we go. Anyway, so let's save that. Right. Okay, so to start things off now with actually creating the new code, I'm here in my terminal window, and what I've done here, apart from the two changes that I've just talked about, I have copied the code over from the previous episode, and I've put it into a new folder for episode 8 code. You don't need to do that. If you're simply following along, you can just continue uh, working with the code. Or if you've cloned the repository or downloaded the code from GitHub, link in the description below for that then you will have the code for episode 7 and you can simply make changes to that. Okay, anyway, if we go into the QB Raytrace uh, folder, you remember in the previous episode we rearranged things so that we have the QB Lights and QB Linal, QB Materials and QB Primitives folders. In QB Primitives, we are going to define new files here for our shapes and we're going to create cylinder.hpp and cylinder.cpp and cone.hpp and cone.cpp, okay, in the QB primitives folder. Right, I'm just going to put that back to there. Let's have a look at how we can write that code now. So to start with, I'm in cylinder.hpp, and as always, we start with our include guards. Okay, cylinder h hash define cylinder h hash end if. Okay, so those are compiler directives. Uh, for the include guards. We need to include a bunch of stuff. We need obviously object base dot hpp. Okay. And we also need to bring in dot dot slash dgfm dot hpp uh, so we can define transforms. Okay. That's easy. And then we're putting everything into our namespace qbrt, which we're doing to keep everything neat and tidy. And we define our class cylinder that inherits from public object base, just like that base, just like so, okay? Okay, and let's think of our public methods. We, of course, have the 
default constructor, default constructor, which is simply going to be cylinder, like so. We need to override the destructor from the base class. Okay, so virtual uh, tilde cylinder override, just like that. And then we need to override the function to test for intersections. Okay, standard uh, procedure with our code. So virtual rule test intersection const qbrt colon colon ray reference cast ray comma qb vector double uh, reference intersection point comma and I just like to tab things out like this to keep it neat and tidy. You don't have to do that. Uh, QB vector double reference local normal and QB vector oops, QB vector double reference local color. Close the bracket and semicolon. And nope, nearly forgot. Let's put the override keyword on there as well. Okay, and that's it. That is everything for cylinder.hpp. So let's save that. Now let's go on and have a look at how we can implement cylinder.cpp. So I'm in the cylinder.cpp file. And this is pretty straightforward. I mean, it gets a little bit cumbersome, a bit long, but it's not complicated. So first of all, hash include uh, cylinder.hpp that we've just defined, of course. And we're also going to need to hash include cmath so that we can get the math functions. Okay, and then we define our default constructor qbrt colon colon cylinder colon colon cylinder just like so and we don't need to put any code in there uh, we have our destructor also uh, with no code cylinder colon colon tilde cylinder and we don't need to do anything there either but we do need to define them and then we need the function to test for intersections okay this is really the only one that actually matters so bool qbrt colon colon cylinder colon colon test intersection well i say it's the only one that matters you do need the others um, it's not like you can get rid of them const qbrt colon colon ray reference cast ray okay uh, qb vector double uh, reference intersection reference not star sorry reference intersection point comma and comment tab those out uh, qb vector double reference local normal and qb vector double reference local color just like so okay right just like that okay so the first thing we're going to do is copy the ray and apply the backwards transform from this object so we have qbrt colon colon ray bck ray is equal to m transform matrix that is the transform matrix defined for this object m transform matrix dot apply uh, cast ray uh, comma qbrt colon colon bckt form for the backwards transform okay to copy the MLAB vector from BCK ray and normalize it. Okay, so that's easy. QB vector double V equal BCK ray dot MLAB. Okay, and V dot normalize just like that. And obviously that's wrong. There we go. Okay, like so. We need to get the start point of the line, right? So QB vector double P, okay, keeping sticking as much as possible to the notation we used in the slides at the beginning is BCK ray dot M point one, okay? And I'm going to compute A, B, and, and C, okay? So double A. Now this is equal to STD POW for power. Uh, v dot get element v dot get element zero two so that squares uh, the first element of v which is vx so that's vx squared plus std pow v dot get element one two point zero and that's v y squared okay semicolon easy double b equals std no it isn't sorry two point zero multiplied by 
dot get element zero multiplied by v dot get element zero plus uh, p dot get element one multiplied by v dot get element one. Okay, and close that bracket. There we are. And double c is equal to std pow p p dot get element zero two. So that's px squared plus std pow p dot get element one two point zero plus uh, py squared minus 1.0 because we've defined r as 1. Okay, so r squared is also 1, so minus r squared is minus 1. Okay, and now we're going to compute b squared minus 4ac. Okay, double num sqrt for the square root numerator square root <laughs> is sqrtf, a floating point square root of std uh, pow. Uh, b comma 2, so that's b squared, minus 4, multiplied by a, multiplied by c. Okay, and semicolon, there we go. And now we can actually test for intersections, right? I'm going to put some blank lines in here just to move all this up so that we're typing in the middle of the screen and not at the end. So let's have a look. So first thing, we're going to first of all test for first uh, with the cylinder itself. Now this gets a little bit complicated in terms of the logic because we have to consider end caps for the cylinder, right? So the first thing we're going to do though is test for intersections with the cylinder. And what we're going to do, we're going to create an array, std array of type qb vector of type double, okay, like that. Uh, sorry, yep, a qb of four elements, okay, so we're making a four element std array of type qb vector of type double, uh, okay, which we're going to call poi. So we're going to have a maximum of four points of intersection, so two for the cylinder, and in principle, two also for one intersection with each of the end caps. So we're giving us the capability ourselves the capability to store all of them. We then have std array type double also for uh, t because we're going to have four values of t. Okay, and we're going to create some bool flags which are t1 valid, t2 valid, t3 valid, and t4 valid, just like so. Okay, now, so if num sqrt is greater than zero, in this case we might have an intersection. If num square root is, is not greater than zero, then there are no intersections, so we really don't actually need to worry about doing anything. Okay, well, we'll come to the, the else condition for that in a moment. So, if we get to here, there was an intersection, okay? So we need to compute the values for t, right? So t dot at zero is equal to minus b plus num sqrt, like so, uh, divided by two times a, okay? Pretty straightforward. And t dot at one is equal to minus b minus num square root. That's just from the standard equation for solving a quadratic equation. Okay, pretty straightforward. So that's the two possible values of t. We then compute the points of intersection. Now notice we're doing this regardless of whether we think t is valid or not. And there's a reason for that because we also need to include a test for the height, um, you know, to test whether we're actually within our unit cylinder or not. So we're going to compute sort. So poi dot at zero. So this is the first point of intersection is equal to bck ray dot m underscore point one plus v multiplied by t zero. Okay, just like that. Right? And poi dot at one is equal to bck ray dot m point one plus v multiplied by t one. Okay, there we go. Now we can check if any of these are valid. Now this is where it does get a little bit confusing and I spent quite a long time thinking about how to do the logic for this. Uh, this may not be the optimum way of doing it. I think this code probably could do with quite a bit of refactoring, but this method does it does work. Okay, so we'll stick with that. So we start with if t dot at zero is greater than zero. So we're only interested in values of t that are positive. Right? And um, the absolute value, floating point abs, fabs, a POI dot at zero, 
dot get element two is less than one. Okay, so that's the absolute value of z. So if the t value is greater than zero, t uh, the first t value is greater than zero, and the first point of intersection um, has a, an absolute value of z that is less than one, then we know that we are within our cylinder. Okay, so that's pretty straightforward. So in that case, we do t1 valid equals true, because we know that t1, the first t value, is valid, okay? Else, t1 valid equals false. And in the case that it's false, we're also going to set an arbitrarily high value for t is equal to 100 e6, 100 million, okay? So, yeah, so we set t dot at zero equal to that. Okay, now, we now do if t dot at one, so the second value of t is greater than zero, and this is basically the same code, and fabs poi at one dot get element two, it's less than one, so we're just basically less than 1.0, so this is essentially exactly the same, but we're now testing for uh, the second point, so t dot at one and poi dot at one, okay? So in that case, we have t2 valid equals true, All right? Otherwise, t2 valid equals false, and t dot at one equals 106, okay? Just like that, All right? So that is the end of that if statement and the end of and the end of this if statement here, okay? So if num square root is greater than zero, so we come to there and then we have else. So this is the case where you didn't have an intersection, in which case both t1 and t2 are invalid. t dot at 0 equals 100 e6, and t dot at 1 equals 100 e6, okay? Just like that. Right. Okay, and now we're going to test the end caps, okay? So we're going to use our close enough function. So if close enough, remember this was defined in the uh, object base class, so if close enough v dot get element 2 to 0, right, right, so what that means is that we clearly don't have an intersection. So we're testing that if basically we're parallel to the end caps. So if if the z coordinate of v is very close to zero, then that means that we must be parallel to the end caps and therefore we don't have any intersection. So we have t3 valid equals false, t4 valid, t4 valid equals false, and t dot at two equals 100 e6 and t dot at three equals 100 e6, okay? Else, and now this is where we need to uh, really do something. So else, we have an intersection with at least one end cap, so we need to compute the values of t. Let's bring that back up there, right? So t dot at two is equal to bck ray dot m underscore point one dot get element two minus 1.0 divided by minus v dot get element 2, okay? Now, that is actually really just how we go about implementing um, planes. So that's a plane at um, plus 1 in z, and we're going to implement a plane at minus 1 in z. Now, remember, we are dealing with the unit cylinder defined in our local coordinate system, which is the only reason we can do that. Okay, uh, that is bck ray, not back row. bck ray dot m underscore point one dot get element two plus one. So that's the cap at the other end divided by minus v dot get element two. Okay, so that gives t uh, two and t three, uh, three and four, essentially remembering for zero indexing, of course. And then we're going to compute the points of intersection. So POI dot at two is equal to BCK ray dot M underscore point one uh, plus T dot at uh, two times V and POI dot at three is BCK ray dot M point one plus T dot at three times V. Okay. And then as before, check if these are valid. Okay. 
So if t dot at three is greater than zero and right, s floating point square root square root f Yep, R S T D P O W uh, P O I dot at two dot get element zero squared. Uh, comma two. Yep. So okay, that is so that's the first element of POI dot at 2, which is, of course, x. So x squared plus y squared is less than 1, which, of course, makes it a circular disk. So first of all, if the T is valid, uh, we test if we're actually inside a disk by simply testing our distance from the origin using x squared plus y squared to give a unit circle. It's, it's pretty straightforward. OK, plus std colon colon POW uh, POI dot at Two dot get element one squared. Okay, number two. I close bracket again. That's that one. If that is less than one point zero, okay, then we have that t three valid equals true. Okay, else t three valid equals false, and t dot at two equals one hundred e six, like that. OK, and then we have very, very similar code again. I've realized I've made a mistake here. That is not t dot at two at three. That is t dot at two and poi dot at two and poi dot at two. That is right. OK, so now we have the very similar code again. OK, so we have if t dot at three greater than zero and sqrtf floating point square root std pow poi dot at three dot get element zero squared okay plus std pow poi at three get element one squared less than 1.0 okay then we have t4 valid equals true else T4 valid equals false and T dot at 3 equals 106. Okay. So, first of all, we're going to test if no intersections were found at all, then we can simply stop. So, that is the test for. So, we come down to there. Okay. So, okay. So, what we've done, if, you, if we look at that, is we first of all test for intersections with the cylinder itself. Okay, so if num square root is greater than zero, we run through the test for that, else obviously we have none. And we then separately test for intersections with the end caps. Okay, and we come through to here. Okay, so if we don't have any intersections, then we set those to false, else we calculate whether or not we have valid intersections. Now, so if we had no, if there were no valid intersections, of course found, then we can stop. Okay, it's pretty straightforward. So if not t1 valid, okay, and not t2 valid, and uh, not t3 valid, sorry, and not uh, t3 valid, and not t4 valid. So if there were no valid intersections at all, then we simply return false. We don't do anything, OK? Otherwise, we're going to check for the smallest value. Smallest valid value of t. OK, so int min index equals 0. Right? And double min value equals 100e6. OK, like that. Nope, 10e6, actually. 10e6. Uh, we then have 4 int i equals 0, i less than 4, uh, plus plus i, like so. And we're going to test within that loop, we do if uh, t dot at i is less than min value, okay, then min value equals t at i, it's pretty straightforward, min index equals i. 
and close that. Okay, so when we finish that loop, min index will give us the index of the smallest value of t, smallest valid value of t. And this is why we bothered setting the values of t very high if they were false. It just means that, you know, this test will definitely uh, succeed. Um, as I say, this code could be refactored, but uh, anyway, what we have is indeed acceptable. So we now have that if min index uh, is either 0 or 1, then we have a valid intersection with the cylinder itself, okay? So, QB vector double valid POI equals POI dot at min index, okay? So that's the uh, relevant point of intersection. If min index is less than two, Now that we have to divide this into two blocks of code because the way we go about calculating the surface normals is different depending on whether we're in the cylinder or the end caps. Okay, so in this case, we are in the cylinder. So if min index is either zero or one, we know we're in the cylinder. Okay, so first thing we need to do is transform the intersection point back into world coordinates from our uh, local coordinate system. Okay, so int point is equal to m underscore transform matrix like that dot apply and valid poi comma qbrt colon colon fwdt form by the forward transform okay and now we're going to compute the local normal so we need to define some stuff we have qb vector double original normal three okay it's three element qb vector double uh, new normal also three elements, uh, qb vector double, local origin, which uh, we're going to define as std vector double um, 0 0.0, 0 0.0, 0 0.0, 0 0.0, like so. Okay, that's the local origin. Um, qb vector double global origin, which is equal to m transform matrix dot apply apply with a capital A sorry dot apply local origin comma qbrt current colon fwdt form so that will transform our local origin back into our global coordinate system then have uh, original normal org norm dot set element zero uh, to valid poi dot get element uh, zero all the normal dot set element one valid poi dot get element one and all the normal dot set element two to zero point zero. Now if you think about that, all, all we have is a cross section of our cylinder is simply a circle, and so the normal to the circle is simply going to be um, the vector pointing out from the center. Uh, in the direction of the point of intersection. And because it's infinite in Z, the normal in Z just stays at zero. It's always going to be flat in our local coordinate system. So if we calculate org normal is in the local coordinate system, and then we're going to translate that back. So we now have the new normal is equal to m transform matrix dot apply uh, org normal comma qbrt kernel kernel fwdt form for the forward transform minus global origin okay and then we do new normal dot normalize to normalize it and local normal which is our return variable local normal equals new normal just like that okay and finally return the base color uh, local color equals m underscore base color semicolon Return true because that was a valid intersection. Okay, so in the event that our min index is not less than two, right? In this case, otherwise check the end caps. So if not close enough, v dot get element two to zero. into 
check if we are inside the disk. If square root f um, std colon colon pow valid poi dot get element um, zero two squared plus std colon colon pm dot pow valid poi dot get element get element one squared close bracket close brackets is less than 1.0 okay so we're in the disk right and then we're going to do this transform the intersection point back into the world coordinates right so intersection point is equal to m transform matrix dot apply uh, to valid POI, exactly as before, QBRT colon colon uh, FWDT form, or transform, like so, and compute the local normal. Let's do that. So we have QB vector double local origin as STD uh, vector double so 0 0.0, 0 0.0, 0 0.0, right, like so. QB vector double normal vector. That's STD vector double 0 0.0, 0 0.0, and 0 0.0 plus valid POI dot get element 2. Okay, so that is slightly different. And what that is doing is simply setting our local normal as either plus one or minus one, depending on uh, the z coordinate of valid POI. Okay, slightly different. Uh, QB vector double, uh, global origin is equal to m transform matrix dot apply local origin to and QBRT colon colon FWDT form for the forward transform. And QB vector double. Oh no, we don't need that. Sorry, local normal. Local normal is then equal to M transform matrix dot apply to normal vector. QBRT colon colon FWDT form minus global origin semicolon. Just that. And local normal dot normalize with a capital N, sorry, normalize, like so. That's it. And return the base color. And local color equals M underscore base color semicolon, okay? And return true, because that was a valid intersection. Okay, so now, if that wasn't successful, then simply return false, right? Straightforward. That's that one. And then there, and we do the same here, so else, uh, return false. Okay, so these are all just all the false conditions. And then that one, if we get down to here, somehow uh, return false and save. Okay, and that should be everything really to implement cylinders. Now it's quite a lot of code and the logic is a little bit convoluted and I do think that this code probably could be <laughs> could be refactored uh, quite considerably but I have tested this and it does indeed work. So the first thing we're going to do is let's have a look at modifying the scene class so that we can actually uh, make some use of this. So first thing in scene.hpp, obviously we need to add a new shape. So we hash include dot slash qb primitives slash cylinder dot hpp. Okay, and save that. And then in scene.cpp, we have a lot of code here um, that we've used already to set things up. What I'm going to do is delete pretty much all of it. Okay because we simply want to test our cylinder and this is all getting very convoluted now. Um, I'm going to leave the definition of floor material. I think we can get rid of that and get, just get rid of those. And let's leave floor material there uh, like so. All right, configure the camera, we'll leave that as it is. Um, and then all this code I've got here to set up these objects, let's get rid of it all, okay. Uh, except for our lights. Okay, so we're going to delete all of that. Ooh, come on. 
Oh, I don't know why it doesn't want to work now. So we're going to delete all of that code, and there we are. Okay. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create another material. So we've got floor material. We're going to keep that. And I'm going to just create for now auto um, blue diffuse material. Blue diffuse is equal to std colon colon make shared qbrt colon colon simple material. Uh, qbrt colon colon simple material just like that. Okay. And then we're going to configure those materials. So we have set up the materials. That's floor material. We'll leave that. We're going to do blue diffuse m underscore base color equals qb vector double st double uh, std vector double uh, 0.2, 0.2 and 0.8. Okay, like that. We're going to configure that to have a m reflectivity of uh, 0.05, very low, and blue diffuse. And we're going to set shininess equal to 5.0, just like that, OK? Floor material, we're going to leave as it is. OK, so that's that. Save that. Now, we need to actually construct our objects, because we haven't done that now. So. So create and set up some objects, OK? So we're going to do uh, the floor first, auto, floor is equal to std, colon, colon, make shared, like so, uh, type qbrt, colon, colon, object plane. QBRT colon colon object plane. Just like that. And then floor. We're going to set transform matrix. QBRT colon colon GT form. We're going to define the transform matrix uh, directly in here. Okay, so QB vector double. We'll type STD vector double. Uh, 0, 0.0, 0, 0.0, 0, 1.0. So that is our floor, which is at minus 1. And tab that out. QB vector. So that's our translation. Let's define our rotation. STD vector double uh, for our floor is obviously to 0. 0, 0.0. And uh, QB vector scaling, QB vector double, STD vector double, and our scaling. We're going to make the floor quite big, so we're going to do 16.0, 16.0, 1.0, 2, and 3. Okay, and close that bracket. Right, so that sets the transform matrix, and then we simply do floor assign material and we pass the reference to floor material, just like that, OK? That's pretty straightforward. Now we're also going to set up a cylinder. Auto cylinder 1 is equal to std make shared of type of type qbrt colon colon cylinder, OK? qbrt colon colon cylinder, like that. And cylinder 1 set Transform matrix QBRT colon colon GT form. So we'll set the translation STD vector double. Okay, QB vector STD vector double. And I'm just going to leave this at the origin. Okay, zero, zero, like that. So it's simply at the origin. And we have rotation. I'm not going to rotate it. Double STD vector double uh, zero 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 and scaling QB vector double STD vector double. Let's just leave this at one one and one. So we will get exactly our unit cylinder and we assign to it a material cylinder one 
assign material and I'm going to give this blue diffuse, like so. Okay, and then we simply need to put these objects, these objects into the scene. So we simply have m object list dot push back um, floor and m object list dot push back cylinder one and save it. And that is everything that we need to change. So let's jump to our terminal window and try compiling this. And we're probably going to get a bunch of errors, but uh, hopefully nothing too bad. Uh, so let's have a look. OK, so I'm in the terminal window in the main folder, so we can just run make and let's just see if our new code and predictably we have an error here. So first off, uh, no matching function for called GT. OK, in scene.cpp line 56. OK, so scene.cpp line 56. Let's have a look at that. OK, so scene.cpp line 56. Is that one? All right, what's wrong? Ah, yes, of course, because, oh, I forgot, hang on a moment. So the other thing that I forgot here, we need to look at gtfm.hpp. Okay, so gtfm.hpp, all right, this is the, yeah, this is the HPP file. All my comments are wrong, aren't they? So this is the HPP file. And the problem is, is we need a constructor for GT form that will allow us to construct it based on uh, the input uh, value. So we're going to define a new constructor. We already have to construct from a pair of matrices, but I want to construct, be able to construct from three vectors. So we're going to put that in, uh, construct from three vectors. Okay, and this is going to be GT form as it accepts as input const, uh, where are we? Yep, const qb vector double reference translation, const qb vector double reference rotation, and you can probably guess const qb vector double reference scale, like so, okay? So that is the template for that. So let's go to gtfm.cpp. So in gtfm.cpp, we're going to put in our new constructor here, construct from three vectors. All right, so qbrt, colon, colon, gt form, colon, colon, gt form, const qb vector double reference translation, const qb vector double uh, reference rotation and const qb vector double uh, reference scale okay so we simply define this function it's really very straightforward all it's going to do is call set transform uh, translation rotation scale just that and save that is it okay so now hopefully if we compile now well we should get more success Right, so back to the terminal window, let's see. Okay, GTFM compiled. Okay, and we have a problem in cylinder test intersection T3 valid was not declared in this code. So cylinder.cpp line 106, right? Cylinder.cpp line 106. Uh, yeah, of course it is T3 valid with a capital V and save that, okay? So let's try again. Okay, uh, light dist was not declared. Did I mean light dir? No, I did not. Okay, we need to have a look at that. That is point light dot cpp line sixty seven. Okay, point light dot cpp. Yeah, so called light dist uh, double dist less than greater than light dist. Okay, okay, yeah, I forgot my fault. Sorry. So where we calculate light dir, we also calculate here double light dist um, is equal to m underscore location minus int point dot norm just like that okay that should do for that okay and let's try okay and let's try running it and hopefully And there we go. You see, we have a unit cylinder. It's quite large being a unit cylinder, but it's positioned at the origin. It's blue and our diffuse uh, color exactly as we wanted. We can see it has an end cap exactly as we wanted and 
there we go. So that is everything that we need to do to implement cylinders. That did actually take me a little bit longer to go through than I expected, but I think uh, it's probably uh, worth it. I think the results there are really uh, quite interesting. Okay, so without much further ado, what I want to do is just jump in and have a look at how we can implement the code for cones. It shouldn't take too long because it's actually really very similar to how we do cylinders. So let's jump in and look at that now. Okay, okay so since the code for cones, is, well, I mean, we saw with the theory right at the beginning that implementing cones is very similar to implementing cylinders. And therefore, of course, the code to do it is also very similar. So I figured this video is already long enough. Nobody needs to sit and watch me typing that code, almost identical code, out again. So what I've done is simply, I've done the code already and I'm just going to talk about it. So this is cone.hpp that I've created inside the QB primitives folder. And as before, we hash include object base and GTFM, and then we define our class cone as being a, a, a child class of object base. And then we simply define our, our default constructor, we override the destructor, and we define and override the test intersection method. And that is it for cone.hpp. So you can simply type that in if you're following along, okay? Now, cone.cpp is quite long because it uses a lot of the same logic that we just went through for doing cylinders. But, like I say, it's really very much the same, so I didn't want to sort of go through and type it all again. So cone.cpp, again, created in the QB primitives uh, subfolder. And the only interesting function here is really the one to test for intersections. I mean, you need the constructor and the destructor, of course. But then the test for intersection methods, it's pretty much exactly the same. We simply cast the ray and we apply the backwards transform. And then we copy the m underscore lab vector from bck ray and we normalize it. We get the start point of the line. And where things change is how just here. So we compute the values of a, b, and c for the quadratic equation. But this time we've got, so here, uh, vx squared plus vy squared minus vz squared. Here we have px v plus times vx plus py times vy minus pz times vz. And we have p squared, px squared plus py squared minus pz squared. Okay, that is the difference. So go back to the size of the theory if, it, if that's confusing. And then other than that, everything is essentially the same. Except, of course, the difference here is we only have one end cap for a cone, obviously. So we only define three elements for POI and three elements for T, and P, and we just have T1 valid, T2 valid, and T3 valid. But other than that, it's exactly the same. So if num square root is greater than zero, this is testing for intersections with the cone itself. We do exactly the same thing as before. We basically solve the quadratic equation, and then we test to see if any of those are valid or not. Okay, and I've just commented these lines out because we, we don't do that, so let's just delete those. Uh, and there we are. Okay, it's exactly the same as for the cylinder, okay? And then we test for the end cap, which is also exactly the same. We test, first of all, if our ray is likely to be parallel to it. If it is, then obviously we have no intersection. If it isn't, then we uh, compute the values of t exactly the same way and test if we have a valid intersection or not. And then that's it. The Where it does get a little bit different, of course, is how we go about calculating the local normal. And the difference here, now, this is all the same. We have tx, ty, and tz are the x, y, and z elements of the normal vector. So tx and ty are simply equal to the points from PO, valid POI, exactly as we did for the cylinder. Now what's different is tz, because tz was simply, so the z value of the, or the z direction, if you like, of the normal vector in the case of a cylinder was simply zero, because in our local coordinate system we defined a cylinder orientated about the z axis, so the normal is simply going to lie in the z plane, in the xy plane, sorry. Now for a cone, that isn't the case. For a cone, the uh, normal vector is going to point out perpendicular to the surface of the cone. And if you do the math, it works out that the um, you can get the normal z value simply using Pythagoras, so it's equal to minus the squ floating point square root of tx squared plus ty squared, okay? And you can actually, you can work that out using simple trigonometry uh, to see where that's come from. If you think about the triangles, it's really not too difficult. And there we go, and then we calculate org normal as before, with the original normal and then new normal, we simply transform that, subtract the global origin, and there we are. And then the end cap, that's exactly the same, except we have just one of them, and that's it. That is cone.cpp, so let's save that because I made some minor changes. Now let's go back to scene.cpp and let's actually create an instance of our cone. First of all, to do that, the first thing we're going to do is in scene.hpp, we're going to hash include dot slash uh, hash include 
if I could spell, come on. There we go, hash include dot slash qb primitives. Now, before someone points it out, I do know that I've spelled primitives wrong here, but I'm not going to go through and change it now. <laughs> so that's okay. So hash include uh, dot slash primitive slash cone dot hpp. Scene dot cpp. What we're going to do, let's make a new material. We're going to call this, uh, let's have yellow diffuse. Why not? std make shared qb rt colon colon simple material, like so, qbrt colon colon simple material, right, and we're going to define that, yellow diffuse, m base color is qb vector double, std vector double, and right, okay, so we're going to define these at 0 0.8, 0 0.8, 0 0.3, okay, like so, and yellow diffuse, uh, reset M uh, reflectivity, 0 0.05, uh, the same as for blue, uh, which makes sense, and yellow diffuse M shininess 5.0, okay. So now let's create and set up these objects. We're going to define cone one. So auto cone one std make make <laughs> shared. There we go. Qbrt colon colon cone. Uh, Qbrt colon colon cone. Just like that. Semicolon. Cone one set transform matrix. QBRT, colon, colon, GT form, QB vector, double, uh, yeah, STD vector, double, like so, and I'm just going to define, actually, let's, let's do it, let's put this at plus one on X, okay, and we, so that's the translation, and we define the rotation, I'm not going to rotate it at the moment, double, so we're going to put 0, 0, and 0, and we define our scaling, vector double, std vector double, I'm going to scale it slightly in x and y, but not in z, okay, like that, okay, and cone 1, we assign material, yellow diffuse, okay, just like that, and then we just have to put that into the scene, we do m, Object list dot pushback. Uh, pushback cone one. Oh, come on, cone one. There we go. And that's pretty straightforward. Now I just want to modify our cylinder, so I'm going to put it at minus one, and I'm also going to scale it to 0 0.5, 0 0.5, and one. Okay, so let's have a look. Right, so back at the terminal window, let's run make. That should. <laughs> okay. Yes, and I can see what I've done there, yellow diffuse. So in scene.cpp line 32, scene.cpp line 32, yeah, you need to close that bracket. Okay. QB, QV vector is not defined, scene.cpp line 73. It's a clumsy of me, line 73. Yeah, obviously QB vector, save. Okay, and it's from QB ray, see what we get. Hopefully, we should get a cylinder and a cone in our scene. And there we go. Indeed, we do. So we have a yellow cone. Uh, the floor is reflective, so we see that. And we have our unit cylinder that we've scaled. So there we go. We can see pretty much everything working as we want. But let's just test a few things. Let's try rotating them and see if we get the results we expect. So just in scene.cpp, I'm going to define a rotation about the x-axis. And I'm going to define for the cylinder minus m pi divided by 2, or divided by 4, actually. And for the cone, we're going to do plus m pi divided by 4 and save that. Okay, so m underscore pi comes from the standard libraries, uh, gives a good definition of pi to double precision. So go back to our terminal window. Let's compile it again and rerun dot slash qb ray.
And there we go. So we can see clearly the end caps are working as we would expect. Uh, see our cone and our cylinder have now both been rotated. Um, okay, so okay, so just to recap, that's all pretty cool. I just wanted to show how I actually produced the demo image that I showed before. Uh, actually making this video because it was kind of cool. I'm not going to go through typing the code. I'll just show you what I did. So we set the camera position here to 3, minus 5, minus 2 and modify things. I did change the horizontal size from 1 to 0 0.75. That is worth noting. And then I set up materials for also my materials for silver, gold, blue, yellow, orange, diffuse colors, the floor material and the wall material. Silver we talked about. Gold is the same. It's just a different color, slightly less reflective. Blue and yellow on orange, diffuse and floor we've covered. And the warm material is just predominantly red with a high reflectivity. And then we just set up the objects exactly as before. We have cone, left sphere, right sphere, top sphere, floor, left wall, back wall, and cylinder one, cylinder two, and cone two, and so on. We add those to the scene. And then the lights also different. There's only two lights here, and the lights are both exactly white. So that is the code in scene.cpp that actually renders the scene. So let's go to the terminal window, compile this, and just check that we get the right result. Okay, so here we go. So let's compile. Um, it's already up to date because I'd already done it, so we don't need to run that again. And run just run dot slash QB ray. And we can see it's quite slow because we've got a lot of multiple reflections and things going on. So the walls are reflective and there's, so there's bouncing of rays from one wall to the next wall and so multiple bounces and everything else. And we've got quite a few shiny objects. So it does run quite slowly, but it, it will get there in the end. And as I've said all along, we're not aiming for real time. This is really a project to be educational, explain how ray tracing works, and to really explore the fundamentals of ray tracing, you know, and obviously there's a lot of refactoring that could be done with this code. Interestingly, to get anywhere near real time, you need to do multi-threaded stuff. I mean, you know, anyway, and there we go. So that is the uh, final scene. We see we've got the two cylinders here, the two cones, spears, walls, everything. So that is demonstrating all of the objects that we are now able to create. Okay, which I think is pretty exciting. And really, that is everything that I wanted to talk about today. I think we've covered quite a lot there. We've covered all of the theory about how we implement cones and cylinders. And then we've had a look, a uh, detailed look for cylinders anyway, about how we actually implement that in C++. And we talked about how the code for the cones is virtually the same. So we didn't cover that in the same detail. And we produced some example results that really start to look quite nice. And I think actually, are starting to look really quite interesting and it really seems like we're beginning to get towards having um, a fully featured ray tracer. So as I say that's everything I want to talk about this week. The next video I'm thinking to have a look at uh, UV space and textures because one thing that's missing from this of course is the classic checkered floor that everyone does in ray tracing demos and at the moment we can't do that so in the next video I want to focus on how we can do simple texture mapping. Okay. Anyway, listen, I really hope you've enjoyed this video. It's been a great deal of pleasure making it. If you have enjoyed it, please do remember to hit that like button. It does help significantly with the YouTube algorithm. And if you haven't done so already, please consider subscribing to my channel so you don't have to miss any future videos. Thank you very much. Anyway, listen, it's been a pleasure. I really look forward to seeing you in the next video. Thank you very much for watching. Bye.